this is Levi Turner. I'm an enterprise architect here with Click, and today we will be covering event-driven actions and workflows with ClickSense. When we're talking about event-driven actions and workflows in ClickSense, practically what we mean include push notifications on specific conditions inside of ClickSense. Examples of this could include reload failures, so when an application reloads and fails, failed authentication attempts, application changes, for example, a publish, or service instability. We can also mean integrating ClickSense with existing alerting infrastructure, like Splunk, Nagios, or the like. To solve the previously discussed problems, there are a couple of classes of types of solutions. Natively inside of ClickSense, there are a couple of appenders that are exposed as a part of Apache's Log4Net library, which ClickSense can use. Those include the SMTP Appender, as well as the UDP Appender. Others are available, but we will not discuss those. Additionally, inside of ClickSense, there is a repository notification API, which can be used to push notifications in JSON to an endpoint. Outside of ClickSense itself, but with inside of Click's suite of software, there is an SMTP appender, which is a part of the Click Web Connectors. Outside of ClickSense entirely, Examples of this type of integration can include Logstash, Splunk, as well as Nagios, or a custom solution. Now that we have overviewed potential solutions, we can get into the relative pros and cons of each solution. The SMTP appender is relatively easy to configure, but the output is unsophisticated. This may be ideal for certain solutions, like email alerting on reload failure, but for others, a more sophisticated approach may be needed. Additionally, the requirements are none outside of ClickSense, with the exception of a mail server, which most organizations already have. The UDP appender is relatively easy to configure, much like the SMTP appender, and the output can be quite sophisticated, but it will require some entity to listen to the responses and take some action. The notification API is relatively complex to initially configure, some of that is owing to the fact that you can do a high degree of filtering and control at that level. Additionally, the customizability of the output is quite high, but you will need to have some endpoint that is listening for the JSON response and takes the desired action. The SMTP connector, that's a part of the Click Web Connectors package, is a little more complex to initially configure than the SMTP appender, mostly owing to the fact that it has to be installed and run as a different service. The output is a little bit more customizable, mostly due to the fact that it can send HTML reports rather than plain text emails. But additionally, it doesn't have requirements outside of ClickSense with the exception of a mail server. Third-party solutions, like the ones previously discussed, may be easy, moderate, or difficult to configure, depending on the robustness and sophistication of those products. The customizability can be anywhere in between, high, medium, low, and additionally, we'll require those products to be configured outside of ClickSense. This, though, may be an ideal solution for organizations that have already made investments inside of those technologies. Now that we've done an overview of the types of alerts that are possible, we'll do quick demos on each. The first is going to be the SMTP appender. On the left-hand side, we have a filtered QMC with two types of tasks which will trigger to failure. On the right, we have a web interface for a demo mail server. The configuration file, named local log config.xml, lives in C program data click sense scheduler. If you'd like to deploy this to other services that are eligible, for example the repository, the proxy, or the printing service, place the configuration file in their directories. For the specific configs, there are a couple of simple parameters. We're defining the minimum level at which we, we want to listen, which will be an error. We're defining some parameters for the email itself, to, from, and subject. We're defining authentication for the mail server. In this case, it's very basic because it's a demo server. More sophisticated examples for Gmail and Office 365 will be provided. We're defining the format of the email. This will be sent in plain text and we're configuring listeners on different loggers. The first logger 
will correspond to applications that fail to reload due to script-related problems. The second one are for applications that fail to reload for system-related problems, namely aborts, whether aborted by a user or by the system. When I say loggers, I'm referring to the precise logger that's defined in the application logs. In this case, it's the scheduler log. If you'd like to extend this to other services or use cases, a review of the log files to find which entries you'd like to trigger conditions for will be required. When we go into the QMC, we'll start the first task. We expect to get an email fairly quickly indicating that it failed. It'll print the date, task name, app name, as well as the actual error message from the log. This indicates that it fails for script reasons. For the second one, we'll start the task and then immediately abort it. And we've now got an alert indicating that it was aborted. Now that we've reviewed the SMTP appender, we will be reviewing the UDP appender. Much like the SMTP appender, the configuration file named local logconfig.xml is deployed into the relevant service. In this case, we have one in the proxy as well as the scheduler. The configuration file is similar to the SMTP appender, but with more basic configuration. We're simply pointing at a remote server, in this case a local server, and a remote port, a given port. The same principles apply. We're still matching against the logs, and we're still sending a message. This message can be in a pattern or as an XML file. On the bottom part here, I have a simple Node.js service that's listening for responses over UDP, and we can see here a session request from the proxy. That's one of the appenders that is configured. It's listening for sessions. This is the result from those logs as specified here. In the task section, similar to the SMTP appender, we'll go ahead and start this task, which will fail. It'll give us a very similar response. And again, start and stop. Once that finishes, we'll get a response here. I've commented out code here, but we can change the layout pattern to show a different response. And now we have XML that is passed to the desired endpoint. Now we'll cover the repository notification API. This screen is different than before, but we're using Postman here to issue and visualize API calls. The first call that we have queued up here is the creation of the notification. We're going directly to the repository and to the QRS notification endpoint, and we're passing several parameters. The first parameter is name in this case, execution result. The execution result is the entity in the repository that gets created or updated on a state change of a task, from nothing to started, started to running, running to finished, failed, or error. The next parameter is the change type. In this case, we have set to two. This change type is an element of the notification API, and we'll cover how to map these in a second. The third key parameter is a filter. In this case, we're filtering on status equals 8. This filter is applied to this entity, and we'll cover this mapping next. To determine the mapping, call QRS about OpenAPI main. You'll get a very large JSON response. I have it prettified here, so we can drill down exactly to what we want. But when we scroll to the notification element here, we have the enum mapping for change type. 
same site to find here, the enum value here. We have 0, 1, 2, or 3. In this case, we're filtering on 2, which corresponds to update. The reason why we're doing that is because the failure condition happens after a task has already started. So it's only going to be an update of an execution result that's going to indicate a failure. Other use cases may vary, and you may want to filter on add or delete for other reasons. For the filter value, we can scroll to the definition of the execution result. When we analyze the status values, we get a bunch of numerical values and their mapping. We selected eight. This maps to finished fail. So that's a failure of a script due to script-related reasons in most cases. If you wanted to monitor for other state changes, you can create multiple notifications but in this case, we're just monitoring for script-related failures. In addition to the parameters, we have the standard headers for QRS API calls. And in the body, we're pointing to a RESTful server that is listening for the response. In this case, it's localhost, and it's a specified port. When we send this value, we get a handle back. Repeated posts return the same handle, but with that in place, let's start up a server to listen to the responses. This is a relatively unsophisticated Python JSON server. It'll just print out the response. And let's start the task. We see here several responses. The key element here is if we were integrating this into some other workflow, we'd want to take the object ID result here and do further queries and actions upon it. In this case, if we do a git on QRS execution result, we'll get the app name, or at least ID, and task ID. We could determine the actual semantic name by further gets. So a sophisticated integration of this would do further action on these responses. Examples of these style of integrations for the notification API would be to listen on changes to an application, like a custom property being applied, and on certain custom properties being applied, export the application, and import it to the next tier up. So from dev to test, test to prod. And lastly, we will cover the SMTP connector that's a part of the Click Web Connectors package. This was previously known as the Notification Connector, but the principle remains the same. This is a part of the Click Web Connectors package, and I have things configured over here. We have our mail server there, and we have a task here. Now this task, you can see, has a status of success, but actually is failing. Let's just do a quick demo. You get a subject, reload completed. You see here that this is an HTML email, so we can embed a hyperlink to the QMC, and it indicates that it finished with one error. The actual application is a bit more complex. We have a set error mode value here, which allows the status to be successful, although the actual functional load was not. We have a lot of variables being set here. We have an error in the script at this point, and then we have a notification that is sent. We're passing these variables into the body of the email, which allows us to pass the HTML. And this, with later releases of ClickSense and the web connectors, is not using legacy mode, so it's a bit more robust. The only data connection that we have is click web connectors. If you see, it's a web file. I'm actually pointing at google.com. We're using the URL parameter here to rewrite the actual URL that we use. So this doesn't need to be updated. This part does. If we change the script and allow things to complete successfully, 
we'll also get an email saying that it's finished with no errors to review code of the QMC. In this example, we're not filtering on the status value of a task, but it is requiring an additional amount of scripting in the application layer itself, but it is allowing more complexity in the email that is sent. This use case is ideal in situations where the web connectors are already running, so there's a sunk cost at having those configured and running, and you want to allow a bit more verbosity in the email to allow people to go to the QMC by a clickable link. Um, you can additionally pass additional parameters to show where exactly the script failed. This application was taken and revamped from a copy that's on community, but an example of, of the script will be provided.